speak to you today about the Reynolds phenomenon. I give this lecture on behalf of Reconet and of course also on behalf of the European League Against Rheumatism Study Group on Microcirculation and Rheumatic Diseases. What shall we see today? Well, we will go over what is the Reynolds phenomenon. We will mention something about its prevalence. We will learn that autoimmune diseases and more specifically systemic sclerosis is the major cause of secondary Reynolds phenomenon. We will learn that in case of unilaterality, we must refer to vascular medicine. We will learn how to screen for patients who will transition to systemic sclerosis, and for that you need the capillaroscopy. And we will learn in the fast track algorithm how to interpret the capillaroscopy to screen for secondary Reynolds phenomenon. We will say something about the treatment of the Reynolds phenomenon. And lastly, we will give some examples of discoloration of extremities and types of Reynolds phenomenon. So let us start. Who was Reynaud? Well, Maurice Reynaud described as first the Reynolds phenomenon in 1862. He described it as a reversible vasoconstriction of digital blood flow triggered by cold. And this makes the extremity turns first in a white face, then a blue face, and afterwards in a rewarming in a red face. He said this comprise of blood flow can also occur in the absence of vessel wall or vessel disease. On this slide, you can see a historical picture of the temporal sequence of an attack of Reynolds phenomenon. This drawing was made in 1929, and why I always like to show it is because it nicely shows how long a Reynolds attack can take. It started at 10 in the morning with two fingers. It expanded all the way until 10.45, and then it took until 12.30 to resolve. On this picture, you can see the typical zones where the Reynolds phenomenon occurs. The nose, the ears, the nipples, the hands, the knees, and the feet. What about symmetricality? Well, symmetricality helps us to discriminate a primary Reynolds phenomenon from Reynolds phenomenon due to structural disease of large arteries, such as arteriosclerosis or thrombangitis, but it doesn't help us to discern a secondary Reynolds phenomenon due to autoimmune diseases or secondary Reynolds phenomenon due to intravascular factors such as hyperviscosity syndromes. Of note, on last slide you saw a drawing of a Reynolds attack. Nowadays we have more sophisticated techniques to evaluate the blood flow. As you can see here, in the middle you see a laser speckle contrast analysis. And this is a tool which allows us to quantify the flow. First of all, on the right hand side on this picture, you can see here blue, which means a low flow. Red is a high flow, and you can readily see that this connects to the real life Renault attack. With this technique, we can quantify flow and measure them in perfusion units between zero and 100. Now, I told you that Reynolds phenomenon is a reaction versus cold. So what is a normal pathophysiology when you're exposed to cold? And what happens in primary and secondary Reynolds phenomenon? Well, as we said earlier, Reynolds phenomenon occurs because the skin has specialized thermal regulatory vessels that play a major role in normal physiological responses to the environment in order to maintain a stable body core temperature. Here you see the feet of my godson. When he's exposed to cold, nothing happens. Why? Well, this is what we'll explain now. During a cold exposition, you need to maintain your body core temperature. And therefore, your body releases norepinephrine through sympathetic nerves. This consequences in vasoconstriction of your arterial venous anastomosis through skin alpha-2 receptors on smooth muscle cells. And this gives prevention of loss of heat. Hence, the feet of my godson don't discolor when he's exposed to cold. Now what happens in a primary Reynolds phenomenon? 
In the primary Reynolds phenomenon, we have an expansion of sympathetic and cold induced vasoconstriction. We call this a hypersensitivity to cold. And this is presumably due to the increased expression of alpha 2 receptors. This gives, when you're exposed to cold, vasospasm of digital arteries and a slight disruption of nutritional arteries. Now, what happens in a secondary notes phenomenon? Well, we go one step further. You also have comprising intimal lesions in arteries and arterioles and disruption of the nutritional capillaries. This gives a profound disruption in upstream arterial flow and disruption of nutritional flow. And therefore, you get digital trophic lesions. I told you you have change also in capillaries and this change in capillaries is something and we will learn this today that you can visualize with a capillaroscope. What's the prevalence of Reynolds phenomenon? Well on this slide you can see several studies. I will go over one study more specifically the Framingham prospective study which we all know from cardiology but there it was nicely described that 10.9 percent of women and 7.8% of men have the Reynolds phenomenon. So by and large, we always give as a rule of thumb, 10%. What's primary Reynolds phenomenon and what's secondary Reynolds phenomenon? Well, here you can see pi, and you can see that primary Reynolds phenomenon makes the biggest part of the pi. More specifically, 90% of all cases of Reynolds phenomenon are primary Reynolds phenomenon. As we saw two slides ago, primary notes phenomenon are functional changes and are reversible. There is no underlying disease. And the key points to remember concerning a primary notes phenomenon is that 50% of subjects with primary notes phenomenon have a family history of notes phenomenon in first degree relatives, particularly in women and in those with early onset of the Reynolds phenomenon. Also, the onset of primary Reynolds phenomenon is three times more frequent in those aged less than 40 years old. And there's an easy rule of thumb in your clinical consultation to know if someone has a primary Reynolds phenomenon. These are Leroy and Metzger criteria. And they say that you should have strong and symmetrical pulses, so more specifically, no large vessel disease. You should have no evidence of digital trophic lesions. You should have a normal nail salt capillaroscopy, and we will learn today what is normal. You should have a negative anti-nuclear antibody and a normal sedimentation. If you have all these criteria, then you can safely state that your patient has a primary notes phenomenon. Secondary notes phenomenon is a lot less frequent. It only is 10% of all cases of a notes phenomenon. But as we saw on the slide of pathophysiology, there are structural changes. And it's important to recognize because we all know this may lead to irreversible tissue damage. Analysis of secondary Reynolds phenomenon. I always start with this picture because it's a rare cause. This was a lady, a 53 year old with no history, who came to our consultation because she had this since three weeks. Luckily, a very diligent assistant performed a full clinical examination and saw, and this is very unfortunate for this lady, a lung and mama neoplasia, which metastasized to the lung. I always show this picture to teach to the assistant that you always must perform a full clinical examination, even when a patient just comes with Reynolds phenomenon or digital traffic lesions. What we saw on last slide was a rare cause of secondary notes phenomenon. The number one cause of secondary notes phenomenon is autoimmune diseases, accounting for 9% of all cases of secondary notes phenomenon. And in autoimmune diseases, systemic sclerosis is the top. All other causes that are depicted here, like hematological disorder, medications such as beta blockade are less frequent causes of the secondary illness. Now, how to investigate a patient with Reynolds phenomenon? 
The basic investigations consist of lab, full blood count, sedimentation, anti-nuclear antibody, nil-fold capillaroscopy, and of course, a thorough analysis and clinical examination to check for possible connective tissue diseases. In case of unilaterality, we always send to the vascular surgeon who will check the cervical rib and who will do all investigations to see if there's a macrovascular abnormality. So we have just seen that secondary nodes phenomenon is mostly caused to autoimmune diseases and systemic cirrhosis is the key number one. We have seen that we need to use capillaroscopy to discern a primary from a secondary nodes phenomenon. Now, what is capillaroscopy? Capillaroscopy is a tool to look at the microcirculation. And ideally, we look at the nail fold of the microcirculation because this is the only place where capillaries run parallel to the skin surface. You can use dermatoscopes to evaluate the microcirculation with a 50 magnification, and then you can see the whole nail fold. Or you can use video capillaroscopes. Here you see a video capillaroscope. You put the video capillaroscope on the nail fold, you use per standard a 200 magnification, and then you can visualize the individual shapes of the capillaries. This is a normal image. In a normal image, the capillaries have a constant shape and lie on equal distances to each other. I always compare a normal shape to a wedding hairpin, as you can see here. As we saw earlier, in a primary nose phenomenon, you should have a normal capillaroscopy and negative anti-nuclear antibodies. What are normal shapes? Well, we have studies from Andrade who evaluated 800 healthy persons and who showed that the hairpin shape is a normal shape. The torture shape is a normal shape. So this means that the lines bend but do not cross, and that the crossing shape is a normal shape. The lines bend once or they bend twice. We test this definition for reliability, and if we only use these criteria to say that the capillary was normal, the reliability was only 0.53. Therefore, Professor Putolo added an extra criterion before to say that the capillary has a normal shape. He also added the criterion that you must have one of these three shapes, but also the tip of the capillary must be convex. Only if you have also this condition, you have a normal capillary. Using this definition, there is a very high inter-rate reliability to discern normal from abnormal capillary shapes. We have seen what is normal. Here you see a patient with systemic cirrhosis. And patients with systemic cirrhosis or diseases of the scleroderma spectrum, such as mixed connective tissue disease, inflammatory myopathies, may have scleroderma patterns. And Professor Kutulu was the first one to describe this with the 200 magnification techniques. And he discerned three types of scleroderma pattern. The first type, is the early scleroderma pattern, in which you have giant capillaries. These are capillaries with an epical diameter of 50 micrometers or more. The second pattern is the active pattern, which consists of the combination of giants, hemorrhages, and loss of capillaries. We will learn in a minute how to, how to count capillaries. And the third pattern is a late scleroderma pattern, which is characterized by abnormal shapes, if I would ask you what shape this is, then you wouldn't be able to say it's a hairpin shape or it's a torture shape or crossing. No, it looks like a tree. It's an abnormal shape. The late scleroderma pattern consists of abnormal shapes and an extremely low density. If I would count here in, a one, in one linear millimeter, I would count one, two, three capillaries with an abnormal shape. This is a late scleroderma pattern. But we'll see more about that later. Why am I speaking so much concerning capillaroscopy? Well, the one prospective study which followed up patients presenting only with the Renaud's phenomenon and following up all those patients 
for five, 10, 15 to 20 years showed that if you have Reynolds phenomenon at baseline, but no sign of any connective tissue disease, just a Reynolds phenomenon. But if you had a combination of a scleroderma pattern on capillaroscopy and systemic cirrhosis specific antibodies, if you had these three together, then your chance to transition to systemic cirrhosis is 65.9% in five years. This algorithm has a very nice positive predictive value of 79%, which means that if you say to this patient that he will transition, that you're correct in 79% of cases. This patient population we also call early systemic cirrhosis, before the real clinically occurred systemic cirrhosis. And if the patients have puffy fingers, we call them very early VEDOS patients. Of note, the study by Kunig, and I do recommend to read the study, also taught to us that if you follow up patients with a remote phenomenon and no sign of connective tissue diseases, that after 15 years, most of them who transitioned got systemic cirrhosis and only a very small part got other diseases such as RA or Hepatitis. The study by Kunig conversely also showed to us that if you have a remote phenomenon with no sign of connective tissue disease, and if you don't have a scleroderma pattern, and in a minute we will learn to interpret images as non scleroderma patterns or scleroderma patterns, but if you have a combination of remote phenomenon, no scleroderma pattern, no systemic sclerosis specific antibodies, then your chance to transition to systemic sclerosis is only 1.8% in two years. And this is why we reassure these patients. Why do we reassure these patients? Well, because this algorithm has a very high negative predictive value of 93%. This means that if you reassure this patient that in 93% of cases, you are correct to reassure this patient. So this brings us to the fast track study, which was first executed at the live courses on capillaroscopy in Genoa. What was the background to perform a fast track study? Well, as we all saw now, capillaroscopy is an important tool to look at the microcirculation. And we have just seen in the study of Kunig that its role is the early detection of systemic cirrhosis in a patient presenting to us with the Reynolds phenomenon. And we've just seen that you have a very high negative predictive value of 93% and a high clinical positive predictive value of 79%. We always describe the following capillaroscopic characteristics per consensus. First of all, the density, which is the number of capillaries per linear millimeter. Secondly, the dimension, and I showed you that we measure the dimension epically. Thirdly, we evaluate if there's abnormal morphology. And fourthly, we check if there's hemorrhages or pupil. Based on their ample combinations of these capillaroscopic characteristics, an image can be classified as a scleroderma pattern. We saw the seminal study by Professor Kutelo presenting early active late pattern, or as a non scleroderma pattern. This vast variety of non specific abnormalities that you can have in a non scleroderma pattern are sometimes challenging for the non expert capillaroscopist. And therefore, we decided to propose a fast track algorithm to differentiate scleroderma patterns from non-scleroderma patterns in a fast, simple, and reliable way. And after this session today, you will also be able to do this. Making a fast track algorithm, we also, of course, need to assess whether there was inter-observer reliability of this fast track algorithm. So what is a fast trial, a track algorithm? And we will make exercises on that in about five minutes. The fast track algorithm consists of three rules. Rule number one says if your density is seven or more, 
And if you have no giants, then your image belongs to a non-scaled end pattern. Rule number two says, if you have giants, or if you have the combination of an extremely low density, three or less with abnormal shapes, then you have a scaled end pattern. Rule number three says, if your image doesn't apply to rule number one or two, then you should automatically classify your image as a category one or a non-scaled endowment pattern. We'll make exercises on that later on, but first I want to tell you how this study on fast track went. Well, we had one gold standard who selected the images and presented them at the eight Euler Capillaroscopy course organized by Professor Kutelo in Genoa, September 2018. There, at that course, we had, of course, some independent expert, but we had a lot of attendees, mostly novices, which had no experience. Some moderately experienced attendees with less than five years of experience. And some experienced with five or more years of experience. Then we went to do an external validation of the results we got at this 8 ULA course. We went to Nijmegen, where the USTAR course was organized by Professor Van Hogen. And at the 8 USTAR course in Nijmegen, February 2019, we performed an external validation. And you'll see the results of that in a minute. So the gold standard had selected images and show them to the attendees and ask them, after explaining the fast track algorithm, which I will explain to you also in a minute, to classify an image as a scalar gamma pattern or a non scalar gamma pattern. And then statistics was performed. Interrater agreement was evaluated through light kappa and through mean index of reliability. A mean index of reliability evaluates whether the attendee rates the same as the gold standard and is presented by a kappa. The light kappa technique evaluates if an attendee is reliable versus the gold standard, but also how the attendees rate versus themselves. So, what were the results of this study? Well, at the eight Euler Kaplaroscopy course in Genoa, there were 135 attendees from 43 nationalities. We had 68 novices without experience, 53 moderately experienced, and only 14 experienced. At the 8 Euler course in Nijmegen, we had 47 novices without experience, 29 moderately experienced attendees, and nine experienced attendees. We were very happy to see at the eight Euler course in Genoa that the kappa was very high, 0.96. And we were very pleased to see that the novices had a very high kappa, 0.98 versus the gold standard. We went to do an external validation to see if we just didn't get these good results by chance. So we went to Nijmegen and we were very happy to see that at the course in Nijmegen, we also had a very high kappa of 0.94. And again, the novices had a very high kappa of 0.93. This led us to conclude that this fast track algorithm, which had been trained in one hour, has an excellent reliability to differentiate non scalar patterns from scalar patterns by physicians, attendees with varying levels of knowledge. And this algorithm has been validated externally. And this is why I will teach this fast track algorithm to you, not in one hour, but in about 15 minutes. I told you that in capillaroscopy, we have decided with the ULF study group on microcirculation and rheumatic diseases to standardly always evaluate certain characteristics, which you can see here. And I will go over them with you step by step. The first capillaroscopic characteristic is density. 
density is number of capillaries per linear millimeter. And we have very nice studies of Andrade and of Professor Ingenioli to show us that the cutoff for normal is seven or more. When you have an isolated lower density, less than seven, we call it a non-specific abnormality. In the scleroderma patterns, in the early, early scleroderma pattern, you have a still normal density. In the active scleroderma pattern, you have a lower density. And in the late scleroderma pattern, you have an even lower number of capillaries. So let us now use a fast track algorithm to interpret an image together. Here you see a capillaroscopic image. We always look at the capillaries in the distal row. These are the capillaries lying closest to the mirror. And let me count together with you. I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven capillaries. So let us apply the fast track algorithm. Is my density seven or more? Yes, it is. I have no giants, no I don't. So I classify this image as a category one or a non scale down pattern. Let us make another exercise together. Here I count one, two, three, four, five, six capillaries in the distal row. Is my density seven or more? No, it is not. I go to my second rule. Do I have giants? Or do I have a combination of three capillaries with abnormal shapes? No, I don't. So I go to rule number three, which says that automatically I must classify my image as a non-scale down pattern. So if I have this image in a lady with Reynolds phenomenon, then I say that she has a non-scale down pattern, and I check my antibodies. Um, I told you the combination of a scale down pattern and systemic sclerosis specific antibodies is predictive for systemic sclerosis. If you have a scleroderma pattern alone without antibodies, or if you have systemic sclerosis specific antibodies alone without a scleroderma pattern, then your chance is a lot less, only about less than 30%. But to stick with this image, this image has just been classified as a non scleroderma pattern. So if a lady comes with, to you with a Reynolds phenomenon, this non scleroderma pattern, and no specific antibodies, then you can reassure this lady. Second capillaroscopic characteristic is dimension. Here you see the shape of a capillary, and for reasons of standardizations, we always measure the capillary dimension epically and according to the axis of the capillary. This is a normal situation. Here is my epical diameter less than 20 micrometers. In a normal situation, your dimension is less than 20 micrometers. Conversely, in systemic cirrhosis, you have giant capillaries with an epical diameter of 50 micrometers or more. For default, we say that a capillary, which is defined as a giant, should have a normal shape. So the shape should be hairpin, tortuous, or crossing with a convex tip. So if you would have to decide which of the two images is not a giant, then I would say this image is not a giant. Why? The shape is not hairpin, tortuous, or crossing. It's the shape of a tree. So, as I said, a normal dimension is up to 20 micrometer. If you have a diameter between 20 and 50 micrometers, you call it non specific abnormalities. If you have 50 micrometers or more, you call it a giant. So let us apply the fast track algorithm to classify this image as a non scleroderma pattern, the safe pattern, or a scleroderma pattern. Here I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven capillaries. Is my density seven or more? Yes, it is. Do I not have giants? No, I don't. So I can safely classify this image as a category one or a non scleroderma pattern. 
another exercise. Here is my linear millimeter. You can see the green line. I count one, two, three, four, five capillaries. And I think I see here an apical diameter of 65 micrometers, so giant. Let us apply the fast track algorithm. Is my density seven or more? No, it's not. I go to rule number two. Do I have giants? Yes, I do. So I can safely classify this image as a sclerodermal pattern. Of note, it's an active sclerodermal pattern, but it's not within the remit of this session to teach us to discern in between the sclerodermal patterns themselves. It's just the cause of the session to be able to say whether it's a sclerodermal pattern or non sclerodermal pattern, because this is what we need to know to evaluate our patients with the notes phenomenon. Another exercise. Here I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight capillaries. Is my density seven or more? Yes, it is. Do I not have giants? No, I don't. I do have a capillary with an apical diameter of 38 micrometers. So it's a non-specific abnormality of dimension. But it's not a giant. So I stay with rule number one. And I say my image has a non sclerodema pattern. I put this image here because in the beginning when I performed capillaroscopy, this was very difficult for me to be able to dare to say this is a not scalable in pattern. The third capillaroscopic parameter which we evaluate is morphology. We have seen earlier that a normal shape must be either a hairpin shape, a torture shape, or a crossing shape with a convex tips. This is stereotype normal. If you don't have a normal shape, you call it non-specific abnormalities. If you have abnormal shapes combined with severe capillary loss, then you have a late sclerodema pattern. Let us use the fast track algorithm to evaluate our images. In this image, I see one abnormal shape. I see a second abnormal shape. If I apply my fast track algorithm and I check rule number one, is my density seven or more? No, it's not. So I go to rule number two. Do I have giants? No, I don't have giants. Do I have the combination of an extremely low intensity with abnormal shapes? Yes, I do. In fact, this is a late scale. In this image, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine capillaries. My density is seven or more. I have no giants. So I classify this image as a category one. Or a non sclerodermal pattern. I put this image here because in the beginning when I performed capillaroscopy, this was a very challenging image to me. Here I see one, two, three, or five, six capillaries, but I see an abnormal shape. Well, with the fast track algorithm, I do dare to classify this as a non skewed dermal pattern. Is my density seven or more? No, it's not. Do I have giants? No. Do I have a combination of extremely lowered capillary density with abnormal shapes? No. So I go to rule number three, and rule number three says if I don't apply to rule number one or two, I automatically classify this as a non sclerodema pattern. In fact, this is an image with non-specific abnormalities. This can occur in healthy persons, can occur in connective tissue diseases, but it's not a sclerodema pattern. And this brings us to hemorrhages. Here you can see punctate hemorrhages as a non-specific abnormality in a healthy control person. Here you see in hemorrhages in a patient with systemic cirrhosis. I would like to show you one very nice study by Kabasaka, who evaluated in connective tissue diseases patients, if you see hemorrhages, and in normal persons. And what did Kabasaka teach us? Well, he described hemorrhages as punctate hemorrhages, grade one or two, these are both punctate hemorrhages. As in fact, you saw here on last slide, these are punctate hemorrhages. 
And Tabasakal also described hemorrhages as large confluent hemorrhages. Tabasakal showed to us that only 5% of healthy persons have hemorrhages and punctured hemorrhages. Kamasakal also showed that 0% of normal persons have large confluent hemorrhages. Large confluent hemorrhages only occur in connective tissue diseases such as systemic cirrhosis, lupus, and undifferentiated connective tissue diseases. So, just two exercises on the fast track study before we will deal with the treatment of emotion. This image, according to you, is it a scleroderma pattern or a non scleroderma pattern? You may use the fast track algorithm for yourself. Indeed, as you have giants, this is a scleroderma pattern. Next exercise, please use a fast track algorithm to classify it as a scleroderma pattern or a non scleroderma pattern. You have a normal density. You don't have giants, so it's a non scleroderma pattern. These are non specific abnormalities. Last exercise in the fast track algorithm. Please use your fast track algorithm to classify it as a scleroderma pattern or a non scleroderma pattern. Again, it's a non scleroderma pattern. Your density is more than seven, and you have no giants. This brings us to the treatment of remote phenomena. What you always should teach your patients is to do cold prevention techniques. I always ask my patients to look on the internet and to look for electrical heated gloves where the electricity is at the fingers. Some patients ask me, well, can we not just buy heating pads and put them in a glove? No, it's better to have the electrical the electricity running at the fingers. Some patients go further and buy all kinds of material which is electrically heated, like coals and hats, but the most important is to use gloves. If you use gloves, sometimes you don't even need to give medication. If the cold prevention techniques don't work, you can go to medication. The European League Against Rheumatism gave the following advices. As first line, you can use calcium channel blockers. If you have severe remote phenomenon, and remote phenomenon which not satisfactorily respond to calcium channel blockers, you can give 5 phosphodiesterase inhibitors like sildenafil. If oral therapy doesn't work, you can use intravenous prostacycline. In some countries, topical gel formulation of nitroglycerin is being used, and one small study shows that you can also use fluoxetin. And this brings us to the last part of the session. We will give some examples of discoloration of extremities and some examples of types of remote phenomena. Recall that we have a primary and a secondary remote phenomenon, and the primary remote phenomenon occurs very frequent in the general population. This is a case of Laura. Laura is a 15 year old girl. When she walks in the cold or when she performs ballet, her hands first become white and then blue. And this started when she was six years old. Her mother has the same symptoms and her grandmother also. There's a familiar predisposition, young age of onset. She has no digital ulceration and she has absence of anti-nuclear antibody. Laura has a primary nose phenomenon. And as we said earlier, primary nose phenomenon makes up the biggest chunk of the pie of all cases of nose phenomenon. Secondary nose phenomenon. We saw that secondary nose phenomenon is related to condition. To many conditions, as you can see here. Can be related to connective tissue diseases, vasculitis, antiphospholipid syndrome, thrombolysis, 
Sombor and Bordic disease, Pyrotodinomy, Paraprotonomy, and other causes. So we'll give some examples. This is a case of Floris. Floris is a 16 year old boy when he comes to the consultation complaining of muscle weakness. When asked, he also acknowledges to have a nose phenomenon. His lab results show markers of muscle injury. On clinical examination, we find muscle weakness. We see a periorbital rash, and we see cotron populus. Floris has a secondary nodes phenomenon due to connective tissue disease, more specifically dermatomyositis. As we saw earlier, connective tissue diseases are a major cause of Reynolds phenomenon. Let us go to another example. This is the case of Fabrizio. Fabrizio is a male of 40 years old and consults. Due to the black discoloration of his finger, as you can see depicted here. He has nothing to mention in his medical history. He's a construction worker. He has the discoloration of his digit 2 due to Burger disease. Burger or thromboangitis obliterans is a non atherosclerotic segmental inflammatory and clotting disease that mostly affects the small to medium sized arteries and veins of the extremities and leads to decrease or loss of blood supply. Here you can nicely see on his angiogram the bridge collateralism. So other causes are thromboangitis, obitrans vasculitis, and thromboembolic disease, which you should check in a patient who presents with Reynolds phenomenon. And this brings us to the last case because it was a very striking case to me. It's the case of Reuven. Reuven is a 23-year-old Irod boy, but male, who came to us without a medical history. Since six weeks, he developed Reynolds phenomenon and subsequently tropical lesions on finger two and three. There's no tobacco use. He's not taking any medication, alcohol or drugs. His lab doesn't show any remarkable findings. There is no inflammation when he presents for the first time. There's a negative autoimmune serology. There's no pleoglobulinus. There are negative viral tests. There is no abnormality in clotting tests. The only thing in the first lab was an elevated, elevated lactate dehydrogenase. But then, over three weeks, he develops pain in the testis. He performed a PET scan, and the PET scan didn't show any metastasis. In surgery, we saw we were dealing with a seminoma on biopsy. Intriguingly, as removal of the seminoma, we only performed surgical therapy. There was no need for adjuvant therapy. We had resolution of the digital traffic lesions. So again, these are the causes of secondary nodes phenomenon exemplified with some real patients. Key message of today is that autoimmune disease is the major cause of Reynolds phenomenon. And if you have Reynolds phenomenon as only presenting symptom, no other signals of connective tissue diseases, systemic sclerosis is the biggest problem. I want to end with a small note. We also have other discoloration of extremity. One type is erythromelalgia. This is an episodic acro syndrome. And it stands for the following. Erythros is red in old breed. Melos is lined. Alhus is pain. So it's a syndrome which mostly affects lower limbs and which is mostly symmetrical, but which gives red extremities. Red extremities combined with a burning pain. This is what erythromelalgia is, can be primary and secondary. Another example of Discoloration of extremities is acrocyanosis, which is a continuous bluish discoloration of the extremities. 
So resuming, what have we seen today? We have seen what is Renault's phenomenon. We have seen that it's very prevalent. We have seen that autoimmune diseases and systemic cirrhosis are the major cause of secondary Renault's phenomenon. We have seen that in case of unilaterality, we refer to vascular medicine. We have seen how to screen for patients who will transition to systemic cirrhosis. We have learned the fast track algorithm to teach you how to fastly evaluate capillaroscopic images to see if it's safe, a non-scleroderma pattern, or not safe, a scleroderma pattern. We have mentioned the treatment of the Reynolds phenomenon, and we have some, given some examples of discoloration of extreme pain types of Reynolds phenomenon. Having said this, I would like to thank you enormously for your attention. Please, if there's any questions, do ask them. Thank you so much. If there are any questions by the attendees, is everyone muted? Yeah, the all okay. the attendees are muted. Okay, wonderful. Okay, if there's, if there's no questions, I would like to thank you again very much for your attention. Bye bye. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank Pleasure. you. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.